A new Samantha method? Are you kidding me? What's going on? It's Jason Heath, and we're sitting down with the wonderful Cole Davis. Had him on the channel before to talk about his new approach to a timeless classic, the Samandel Method. I've done a video diving into this, which I will link up to here. But this is a really cool approach, and Cole has reimagined the Samandel approach to playing in upper positions, staying in position, something that's really helpful for jazz players and for all sorts of players. This is available on our sheet music store. Let's dive in. Samandel reimagined, how dare you? <laughs> how, did, how did this, uh, when did this idea come? And uh, yeah, what, where did, when did that spark for you? I started working on it like five months ago. I, I finally completed it. It took me about five months to write. And I started thinking about it when I was practicing the Stork Etude to sort of familiarize myself with the whole instrument. And I realized how excruciatingly difficult those Etudes are. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing in itself. I'm just saying if I wanted a more accessible way of playing the whole bass and using open strings to move around the instrument, I would have to invent one. And what better way to explore that than rewriting the Samandel to fit that new sort of base methodology? Absolutely. Well, and so when I think of Samandel, I think, uh, well, I think of many things, but I think of like slowly going up the base one half step at a time and exploring all those. So like, how, how do you go from that to uh, incorporating open strings? I mean, what did, what did, what did that all look like? Are you still going up with those like three notes per, per position or, or what? There's a bit of going up the base because that is essential, but ultimately I'm going up the bass and using the open strings to sort of change position whenever I want. So if I'm going to play the B flat major scale exercise from the Samandel, that would look like this. We're starting here in half position and it's just. Right, just going up like that. But with the new method, you can do it here. doing that what's the point right because if you stay in half position the whole time it becomes very difficult to use it as anything other than a half position exercise but if you integrate these other positions you take a simple b flat major exercise and it becomes this this sort of gateway to improvising and to opening up the whole instrument so So just with a simple exercise, I went from here to here in like four bars without having to do all these like leaps and shifts that make it very hard to improvise. It seems like as somebody who learned just like what you showed right there, it's like stay in half position till you run out of strings and then just go up that G string. It just boxes you in uh, like, I don't know if these are the right directions, but people I've always heard that talk about thinking horizontally on the bass, like going up and down a string versus laterally or vertically. And that seems from my perspective, certainly to like open up so many more doors for creative possibilities. Cause if you're just constantly like going shifting drills up and down one string, you're, you're uh, tiring yourself out and you're limiting, uh, you're you're just limiting your possibilities. Totally. Yeah, totally agree. And the Samano doesn't really offer another perspective, maybe because, I mean, I wasn't around in 1887 when it was written, but maybe because that other perspective didn't really exist. And obviously, Raboth kind of brought it to fruition in his own way. But the idea of playing a B flat major scale without using half position at all was something that didn't really exist yet. And I think the idea of bass Tetris, where you play like this, like a Tetris shape like this, and you ignore all of this, is something that kind of plagues a lot of us as bass players. Because eventually, if you stick to that, you might get tendonitis because your, your arms are doing the same thing over and over and over again. And as I keep saying, it makes it very difficult to play 
creative walking bass lines or solos. So that's kind of my goal with this thing. And it seems hard at first, but it's actually very simple. You just have to do it. It's something that I I always think about when I'm thinking about people who play jazz is like if you're playing in half, think how, how many, you know, B flat, E flat tunes you're playing. If you're stuck in half position and you're doing that three hours a night, every note of the gig, you know, I, I'm predominantly basically a classical player and I'll play down there. But then I have four bars of rest and then I'm in a different part of the bass. And, then, and so it's just a very different experience. And just the it's like the death by a thousand small cuts, whatever sort of thing where you're playing like every note essentially of every gig if your hands up there by your ear versus down a little bit more by your core that's i mean i don't think we humans were meant to have our hand eye level for hours every day you know <laughs> <laughs> that's just my thought <laughs> totally yeah and i always used to wonder why my wrist was like aching after every gig and it's because i listened to all of my teachers who told me, you know, stay low, play good bass lines, don't play too much in the upper register, you know, very like traditional jazz way of thinking. And then I realized, wait a minute, you can stay low and play good, consistent bass lines without just camping out here for three and a half hours. You know, you can play all over. For example, if I want to play an F blues, So that was a good, clear bass line. No soloist would have been distracted or confused as to what I was playing. I didn't even touch half position. I didn't even touch second position, you know? And I could have done that for like 20 minutes and not gotten tired. And that's kind of my point. If you have to do that for 20 minutes and you stay in half position, you're going to be physically restrained and creatively restrained. But if you know how to do what I just did, the options are limitless and the new Samandal will help you do that. So, so like B-flat works great, F works great. Uh, have you adapted every key uh, throughout? Because, I mean, if, if Samandal's one thing, it's methodical. With the other keys, it is harder. Let's take a key like F-sharp major, where, to my knowledge, there are no open strings. So now how do I migrate across the fingerboard if I'm playing an F-sharp major? So the first thing is acknowledging that even in half position and first position, playing an F sharp major incurs a bit of stretching no matter what. So often when I present this method, they're like, well, that's so many stretches, you're stretching, you're making these enormous stretches. And it's, well, if you're playing an F sharp major, you're stretching anyway. F sharp major is not a friendly key for bass players. So rather than sticking to this, Where the notes are further apart because it's the low end you can do this and if i have to walk in f sharp major and i stay down here or, or if i start down here rather i'm going to stay down here Like right now, I'm pretty boxed in. I can't go anywhere. There's like, there's literally nowhere to go because I started here and now I'm staying here because there's no other real options. But if I start here,
options over here. Now I can play the whole bass and still be comfortable. There's a, there's a uh, renowned bass teacher named Ed Barker who's been principal bass of the Boston Symphony for a long time. And I was in a master class with him. Forgive me if I told you the story already, Cole, but like he talked about there are three general fingering scenarios, at least for in, from his perspective. There's the first scenario fingering, which is uh, what you said, uh, bass Tetris. Right? Like I go, go, to, uh, go to the G string you know, in first position, and then go up. And then there's the second scenario, which is kind of where you're living through all these examples, which is like get to the neck block and just like you did in that f sharp it's like you got to start on the low f sharp okay but get to the neck block and you have all these possibilities then his third scenario is get yourself to half position and live there that's that's uh since samandel i don't think goes above the g harmonic for the first book that's less practical of a scenario probably but it's it's really cool that's something i've told students over and over is like get out of the first scenario fingering that's uh you know just like um just the g string world is a, a little bit limiting and yeah just like you said if you start down there you're boxed in and you're probably going to stay down there too and that's the thing the open strings help you get out of that because even in a case like f sharp major where there are no open strings in the scale you still have passing tones within the possibilities of a walking bass line. so not to get too like theory nerd or whatever but if i play So that D isn't really in a B major seven, but who cares? Because in jazz, half the notes are wrong anyway. So right. So I use this D to get up here. And now that I'm up here, I have more. So it's kind of like, you know, if anyone plays chess where you sacrifice, like you're sacrificing the queen. So that way the outcome is actually greater. You just make a small sacrifice or big sacrifice or however you want to look at it at first. So basically the open strings are essential to that. And I would prioritize playing an open string, even if it's the wrong note, so I can get to a more desirable location. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we don't need to just play chord tones all the time. That's a kind of a dreary world, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to demonstrate something from the old version of Samandel, which again is useful but I think we can make it a little bit more efficient and a little bit more applicable to the contemporary bass player. So here's an E flat major excerpt where he uses a one, one shift, which he uses pretty often in the book. So that first finger, is sliding all over the place. So we start with a 1-1 one, one shift. And it, it looks orderly and methodical, but then you try to play it fast, and it sounds like this. Right, it's very difficult. Or you try to play it in a context where like groove is involved, where you have to swing. Kind of interrupts the groove because you're using this third finger, first finger, sorry, over and over and over. With the new method, I've taken away that element of constant shifting, so it looks like this. Right? It's a bit of a leap. It's a bit of a leap from this B flat to this C, but it makes your life much easier. If your hands are big enough to do this, then they are definitely big enough to do this. So that's just one of many examples of how the new book makes your life a little bit easier. Well, I love it. That's the, that's what a what a cool reimagination. Because that's that's the thing that's always kind of bugged me about Samandel is I just felt like I'm just like stuck in these little boxes, and they get a little smaller in terms of the hand span as I go up, but there's still these little boxes. And like how to connect that. It's something that always attracted me about the Raboth approach is there's this flexibility, but there's also a limitation to that too. It's like life doesn't exist on the harmonics all the time, and mm -hmm. and it's 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 cool, and I think it's good for. Uh, 
but there's something there's something so uh, wonderfully systematic about Samantha, which is why I think we basis no matter what style we play, we keep coming back to that method. Uh, and what a what a uh, great uh, shower thought or whatever this came to you to uh, to like <laughs> actually I mean it, it makes so much sense as you're going through it here. That's a look at this new approach to the Samantha method. Thanks for watching and check out what we've got linked up here.